and welcome to the current the North Central Region Water Network Speed Networking Webinar Series. The network is an extension-led collaboration among land-grant universities in 12 Midwestern states, and we are working to build capacity for effective decision-making on water-related issues. Uh, my name is Rebecca Power, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, as a reminder, all of our webinars are archived on the North Central Region Water Network website at northcentralwater.org and also at learn.eextension.org. So you can uh, uh, go back and, and review those recordings, uh, send them to folks that you think might be interested uh, if they were not able to attend today. Our topic for today is land use of riparian ecosystems in the Northern Great Plains, resources for extension and adult education. Uh, the way our webinar works is we'll have three presenters. Uh, people, yeah, you can submit your questions for presenters via the chat box, which is on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, the lower portion of that screen. Uh, we'll have presentations from uh, all three of our presenters and save questions until the end. But feel free to, to enter those questions at any time, and I'll uh, be sorting through those, uh, uh, putting them in, in some order, and helping to, to moderate uh, after all our presenters have finished. Today's presenters, uh, Mary Berg from North Dakota State University. Uh, talking about land use of riparian ecosystems in the Northern Great Plains, empowering our educators. Melissa Wellner from South Dakota State University, The Basics of Land Use Change and Riparian Management for Extension Professionals. And Leslie Johnson from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Nutrient and Manure Management Activities to Enhance the Learning Experience. So these folks all worked on uh, a seed-funded project through the North Central Region Water Network that was led by Miranda Meehan. And uh, we're really excited to hear uh, about uh, not only what they're doing for riparian uh, uh, land use in the Northern Great Plains, but also how they have uh, uh, provided resources for extension and other educators uh, to, to work with the folks uh, in, in their localities. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Mary Berg. Uh, and her, her bio is here. I'm not going to read that to you, but you can see her picture there. And uh, we'll, she can go ahead and get started. Thanks so much, Mary. All right. Thank you, first of all, to the network for having us on and letting us do this. Uh, we were excited to get an opportunity to share what we actually got to do with our project, so we're pretty excited about that. And uh, like Rebecca said, today we're going to talk just about, I'm going to give kind of a general overview of our project, and then um, Leslie and Melissa will follow up with specifics, one in riparian and one on nutrient management. So. We will get started. Let's see if I remember how to do this here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so the intended outcomes for today um, are just to talk to you about the new collaborations that we made, um, talk a little bit about the curriculum development that we were able to develop and that we want to share with other states. Uh, we're going to explain just a little bit about our in-service trainings and the success that we had with those. And then I'll talk a little bit about integration. And so we actually had people integrate already um, what we taught them. And, and so we're excited to share that. So I first want to introduce you to our core project team. So there were 10 of us. And we had quite a variety of disciplines on our team. So we had nutrient management specialists, environmental engineers, uh, natural resource specialists. Um, we also had three universities participating. And so like Rebecca said, NDSU, we had South Dakota State, and then we had University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So during the planning meetings, and we had several of them with the core team members, um, several of us often commented on how much we were learning from the material that was developed and presented by others in the team. And so when we were develop developing this curriculum for these um, in-service trainings, we did peer reviews and practices so that we made sure everything 
um, everyone was on the same page. And when we did that, it really gave each of us the opportunity to learn from each other. So we just thought that was a really um, neat thing of this project that we didn't really think about before we started. So one thing that um, was asked of us from the North Central uh, Region Water Network was to engage 1994 land grant institutions. And we were able to do just that. Um, in North Dakota, we actually got to work with United Tribes Technical College in Bismarck. And that, for us, up here, has formed new relationships and access to excellent facilities that we didn't even know existed. Um, other partners for this project consisted of NRCS, 319s, um, Game and Fish Department, the East Dakota Water Development District. So these partners, I think, were essential to making these trainings really what they were. Um, they participated in various ways. And so some of our partners hosted the classroom portion of our in-service, and some of them hosted the outdoor hands-on portion. Some of them were just in the background for guidance. Um, they would tell us, you know, here's what we saw, uh, here's what we see in the field, and what we think you should be teaching our trainers. And then we actually had some of them come in and teach themselves. And so we were really able to involve our local partners in several different ways. OK, so goal one of the network focused mainly around relationships. And more specifically, we were supposed to strengthen existing or create new collaborations. So at the end of the project, we had to do an end of project evaluation. So each of us team members and partners had to do that. And um, on a scale of one to four, one being not at all and four being to a large extent, each question dealing with relationships was scored above average. So those who took the evaluation increased awareness, formed new relationships, deepened existing relationships, and are interested in engaging in future collaborative work. So now just to move on to our in-service trainings and kind of how we did that collaborative work together. So the project timeline was very efficient. Um, we had just enough time to create our curriculum, peer review it, and then get ready for the in-service trainings. So we had two trainings um, held in June of 2016. And so one was in South Dakota, and Nebraska partnered with them. And then one was in North Dakota at our 1994 institution. Twelve classroom presentations were created and shared in the form of PowerPoint. And then one classroom hands-on activity was created, and that you're going to hear about in the very last presentation today. And then five demonstrations, field demonstrations, were done. So throughout these in-service trainings, we really encouraged active participation. Like, that was a ground rule before we started. You guys, you're here. You have to participate, or you're not going to get anything out of it. And we had great engagements. Uh, get engagement of our participants. So also, each participant received a flash drive containing all of the presentations as well as supporting materials and additional resources. Um, and then, of course, everything is available on the network's website. And I believe somebody can post that link in the chat box while we're going through this session. So everything is up there um, and available for other states to use. And we want you to use it. We want you to ask us questions and really use it. OK, so goal two of the network, um, and one of the primary objectives of this project was to improve participants' knowledge in the topic areas of nutrient management and riparian management. So goal two was really to increase multi-state connectivity and learning. And the next couple of slides are going to show you how we did that. So I'm going to orient you to this slide. It looks a little crazy. Um, so on the y-axis is the percentage of participants, so out of 37 who filled out the pre and post surveys, who rated their understanding of skills and principles um, in these specific topic areas. And then on the x-axis is the, on this slide, going to be manure and nutrient management topic areas that were presented. And the hash marks are. Um, the pre-survey and the solid lines or the solid bars are the post-survey. So I just want to point a couple things out. First, each topic area has some value representing no prior understanding of skills. And so if I can get my pointer, can you see my pointer, Rebecca? You need to drop it on the page. Drop it on the page. I'm just going to do this instead. OK, can you see that? 
Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is the pre. And you can see here that this is the nun. So the purple lines, the dashed in the solid, are the nun. They had no prior experience or no prior knowledge or skills in this area. So we had a bunch of nuns before. And after, we didn't have a single person write a nun in this category. And so that's what you would expect. That shouldn't have surprised us. But it sure um, made us feel like we actually accomplished something when we saw that. because. If we look at the purples before, and then we look at the blue, which was the high, so the solid blue bars are the high learning, um, you can see that we really made a change in their understanding of principles and skills. So understanding was increased a large extent by more than 40% for each of the manure and nutrient management topic areas. OK. There we go. So then the next slide is really similar um, to the last one, except this time we're going to talk about the riparian management or riparian ecosystems management. So there's no doubt, um, not only from looking at this chart, but also just from participating in one of the workshops myself and having very little knowledge on uh, riparian management, this team had their work cut out for them. Um, and you can still see how the solid blue bars are really high afterwards. And so even though um, they had, I think, really hard topics um, and something that, especially in North Dakota, our trainers didn't know a lot about, um, they were still able to increase understanding a large extent from 16 to 48% for all of these topic areas. So that was awesome. OK, goal three of the network was to build capacity of universities to address multi-state water-related issues, specifically expanding successful extension programs uh, to additional states. And so really, they not only wanted us to do in-service trainings, but they wanted other people to take it and use it. And that's what we wanted, too. That's why we created this. And so the next slide is going to show you whether or not that happened. So a couple months after the in-service trainings were complete, we sent out a follow-up evaluation. We wanted to know if any of our participants had incorporated anything we taught them. Um, and each of the subject areas for manure and nutrient management had been incorporated already. So the white numbers on the bars represent individual incorporation of 19 respondents for manure and nutrient management. And then similarly on this slide, uh, this is the repairing ecosystems management. And so again, all of the topic areas, even after just two months, had all already been applied um, by our people that had come to our trainings. And it was really great to see these results. Um, it really solidified that our trainings truly empowered our educators. OK, and so just to go on a little bit more from the empowering our educators, because that's really what we wanted to do, we wanted to know if we had increased our confidence um, for our trainers at all. Have they increased their confidence to know that what they're saying is right, what they're saying is true? And so we found an increase of confidence uh, from the pre and post surveys, um, both for both areas, 48% for nutrient management and a 45% change for riparian management. And so that really, uh, really excited us that our educators are now ready and confident enough to go out and present this. And here's just some participant follow-up. Um, we as a team really feel like the hands-on active um, in-service trainings were a great and essential tool to connect educators to experts, get questions answered, and get their hands dirty in a really safe environment. So some of the comments were, um, well, the obvious one, 1,200 clients in two months were reached. That's awesome. Um, but some of the comments, I'm able to provide landowners and producers with better technical and financial assistance. And then um, this one, I added content to my college class. And so I think that's really important as our next generations are coming up, they're going to learn this stuff right away in college instead of having to come as an adult and learn later. OK. So the very last goal then was to leverage institutional and financial resources outside of the university in both short and long term. So this project was funded by seed money. And it was meant to be short term. Um, however, 50% of our core project team has already applied for um, additional funds for projects that are similar to this. 
So two members of our team have already applied and received over $100,000 um, in these topic areas. So it's really awesome knowing that this project was able to engage people and push them toward making a continued change. And with that, I will stop and let Melissa go, and I will be happy to answer questions at the end. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? You're, yep, you're great to go, Melissa. Thanks so much, and okay. thanks, Mary. All right. Thank you so much. And, and uh, I just, uh, if you kind of notice in my bio, you might see that, that I don't actually have an extension appointment. So this, uh, working with this team really gave me a deeper um, understanding and appreciation for the work that extension does, and, and it was a, a great opportunity for me to learn. So. Um, and I also have to, uh, of course, acknowledge the Riparian team, our leader, Miranda, and um, our other team player, uh, Tom. Um, I, we often uh, work in teams, all of us, and some teams are, are better than others. And this is amongst the, the best teams that I have uh, ever had a chance to work with. So they made this uh, work very enjoyable. So um, just going to go over the riparian management portion of, of our workshop today. And we really uh, combined the classroom and the field together, um, half day in the classroom, a half day in the field, to really look at these three big questions. Um, how do you know a stream or a riparian zone is degraded? What does a good buffer look like and a bad buffer look like? Because not all designs are equal. And what should someone measure in order to assess riparian health and any efforts to restore a stream? So those were kind of the, the big overarching questions that are threaded throughout the classroom and the, the field portions. So in the classroom, to really set up the idea of why this is important, uh, we looked at land use trends, particularly in the Great Plains. And for those of you who live in the Great Plains, um, you're probably already familiar with a lot of the research here. But the landscape of the Northern Great Plains is, is changing. Um, and particularly, it's changing in the three states for which this project um, was related, so North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska. Um, what happens on the landscape affects what happens in riparian areas and what happens in streams and other waterways. So um, in this portion of the workshop, um, I gave just kind of a general overview of these land use trends. And I got a chance to sort of brag on some graduate research that's been going on um, at SDSU. Uh, in relation to, to this topic area. So in the classroom then from there we started talking about, well, how do streams work? How do riparian areas function with streams and stream channels and, and all of that? And um, Miranda had some excellent previous training and, and uh, experience in the Rosgen classification system. And so in this area of the workshop, she uh, talked about Rosgen, how um, the Rosgen classification system defines valleys and stream types, stream types, and really how those might change in relation to changes in the riparian area and how the uplands are used. So this portion of the classroom training was really well reflected in the field um, in a couple of different ways. Um, this is a photo here of the site that we use for the field portion of the South Dakota slash Nebraska workshop. This is a city park uh, stream actually in Sioux Falls. Um, but it's a really good illustration of how we were able to demonstrate to the participants about ripples, runs, and pools, and, and different patterns of how streams flow, how they bend, how they meander. And then we also gave them some practice in the routing classification um, measurements and um, how, to, uh, how to take those measurements and come up with what those uh, stream and, and valley segments 
are. So, um, Miranda, if you can see around all of our next, we have these cards on lanyards, and it, it's kind of a really nice reference to have out in the field in terms of taking measurements, how those measurements are all put together to come up with your classification. Um, so these are photos from the North Dakota site. Um, we didn't have any water in those particular streams. It was uh, a little bit drier at that time of the year. Um, but the participants got to at least take some practice in, in uh, measuring those, those different variables and getting a feel for um, stream types and, and valleys. So then going back to the classroom in our next segment, we talked about riparian vegetation. Why is riparian vegetation important, important and how does it influence streams and channels? And so again, this is a, a, an area where we reflected this back into, well, I'll, I'll uh, kind of preview this, but where we brought it back to the field, and I'll, I'll tell you about this in just a moment, but sort of also related to this, now that we know what riparian vegetation is, is we need to um, instruct on how land use impacts riparian vegetation and riparian health. So um, whatever happens in the riparian zone as well as the upland really affects the structure and the function of riparian areas. But um, best management practices might be able to restore some of that structure and function. So we touched on that in that portion of the, the classroom. And so um, now I'll kind of talk about the field a little bit. Um, in the South Dakota and Nebraska workshop, before we headed out to the field on our, um, our class or our field portion morning, uh, we were able to get NRCS to bring their rainfall simulator and to demonstrate to us, if you haven't seen this rainfall simulator, um, but what, what impact does vegetation have on um, runoff and infiltration? And so what you'll see here um, as, a, as an example of something that our participants saw when they witnessed the rainfall simulator is you have different types of um, management. Maybe it's a conventional till, like you might see on the left-hand side, um, a, either a grassland or maybe a cover crop in the middle, and then a, a no-till kind of system there on your right. And so the simulator simulates a one-inch rainfall event, and then participants can see how much uh, soil is running off from the surface as well as how much water is infiltrating uh, in each of those pans. So it was a really nice demonstration for us to think about before we headed out to the field. Um, and then we looked at managing agroecosystems to improve riparian health because we've got this, this model in our head about what it looks like on the rainfall simulator both from a classroom perspective, how can we um, talk about designing buffer zones to mitigate the effects of upland land use, or um, if it's in a uh, area where we're raising livestock, how can the livestock be managed in order to help protect those riparian zones. And so in the field, we looked at riparian designs. Uh, it, you have probably seen a lot of riparian designs and, and haven't even maybe known it, but <laughs> particularly in city areas, like we saw in Sioux Falls, a lot of riparian zones are um, rip-wrapped. Um, and sometimes that's okay, and sometimes it's not the most desirable uh, form of a design, so we talked about sort of the pros and cons of that approach, um, but we also looked at vegetation and the, the talked about the width of those riparian buffer areas um, and what a good good design might be. Um, from my perspective as a fishery scientist, that's my area of expertise, um, 
I think a lot about water quality because that affects what fish communities are in place. Um, other folks might think of water quality in other ways because they come from different perspectives or have different uh, management objectives. But um, we talked about water quality measurements because whatever happens in the upland and whatever happens in the riparian area is ultimately realized in the stream. And so there are a lot of different ways that you can measure water quality. We talked about um, why some metrics are more important than others or are certainly related to the objectives of uh, your stream or riparian uh, restoration. So and there's a lot of different um, tools that you can use to measure water quality, some of which are very expensive and some of which are very cheap. So we talked in the field more about that. Um, we were able to also talk about cost share opportunities that would help landowners in implementing some of those best management practices to enhance or maintain riparian health and thus ultimately benefit streams. So um, this is a picture of Barry Berg. He um, is with the East Dakota Water Development District and developed a program called SRAM that is um, Seasonal Riparian Area Management for Skunk Creek, which is one of the more uh, more troubling um, tributaries or areas of concern for the Big Sioux River. And uh, this SRAM program is about managing livestock in riparian areas. So he was able to join us to talk about that specific local program um, to our uh, South Dakota and Nebraska audience. So overall, the participant views on this portion of the workshop, um, as Mary already pointed out, were very favorable. Uh, the written comments indicated that the classroom and field activities were well integrated. They really enjoyed learning more about effective riparian buffer design. And um, they were already using what they learned in one-on-one -on -one intera interactions with producers, as well as when they were on the radio and being interviewed by newspapers or writing their own news articles. So overall, they commented that they had a great experience, and so did our team. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Rebecca for the next presentation with Leslie. Great. Thank you, Melissa, so much. Um, and uh, glad to have Leslie Johnson as our final speaker. And I will say in advance, uh, we have had a couple of uh, formatting uh, funky glitches that are not Leslie's fault, uh, but when it was imported into the into Blackboard. So you'll you'll see that, but uh, we'll, uh, it, it won't uh, hurt your experience too much. So just let you know that Le Le Leslie's were, was good, and our, our import uh, turned out sort of funky. So with that, Leslie, uh, look forward to your presentation. All right, thank you. So um, as Mary introduced me, I am Leslie Johnson. I work for the University of Nebraska. And I'm focused primarily on manure management, but I'm going to talk about nutrient and manure management portion of our curriculum that we developed. Uh, and here's one of our slides that it appears to have shrunk everything widthwise. So I'll start today by talking about the curriculum that we developed for the manure side of the training. And then I'll highlight one of the activities that we did. And then I'll discuss the impacts that we found with our follow-up survey. The curriculum that we developed consisted of PowerPoint presentations on the topics listed here, including composting, regulations, spill response, and manure value. All of these pre presentations are available on the North Central Region Water Network website. Um, on your screen is a short link, and I think Mary's going to put the full link in the check box for those of you that can't use that short link. We are aware of those issues. Um, but in these presentation files, there are full notes and or sometimes there's scripts, as well as short activities that were developed along to go alongside of those presentations. And I believe that is the same case, same for not only the manure stuff, but also the um, the watershed stuff as well. 
So one of our goals during the program was to make the training very interactive so that we could enhance the learning as much as possible. Um, to do that, we, they, during the in-services, we had multiple demonstrations. We actually spent an entire half a day outside for each of the different sessions. In the South Dakota training, we demonstrated the use of some in-season monitoring equipment, and the participants actually had a chance to test out that equipment as well. We also composted butcher waste to simulate composting and mortality. That link on your screen will take you actually to a short video of that demonstration. It's been sped up in parts to uh, make it a little bit shorter, but that link does work, and there is one, is a video there. Um, at the North Dakota event, they didn't have the, the possibility of composting mortality, so the group composted manure or demonstrated turning that compost with a compost turner. But at both locations, proper techniques for manure spreader calibration was also demonstrated, uh, and in addition to some other things that we talked about and toured a bit during those demonstrations. So here's the activity that I wanted to spend some time highlighting to get the participants even more involved and really hone in on those manure spreader calibration skills. I developed an activity where participants or groups of participants received a box of supplies to simulate the calibration of manure spreader that was shown on the box. And if you could see behind me today, you'll, you would see a pile of shoe boxes, and those are those kits. I actually have quite a few of them in my office right now. Um, <coughs> so they received this box of supplies, and um, and in those boxes uh, was everything that they need to simulate that manure spreader being calibrated. In North Dakota, the activity was done after they had actually seen manure spreader calibrated, so they had seen it and experienced it, and then they actually got to come inside and do it. In South Dakota and in Nebraska training, we actually did that the opposite way, way where we actually taught them using the boxes inside, and then when they went out to the outdoor demonstration, they were actually able to implement those skills. So it can be done either way. Uh, and the intention today was to show you a quick video of the contents of one of those boxes. If you do want that video, let me know, and I can certainly send you the actual link to it. It's a little bit longer, uh, about eight minutes worth of time of me going through the box and explaining what those things are that are all in it. But just quickly, um, they were given the opportunity to choose from seven different spreaders, which depending on the spreader had a different technique for calibration. The one that is in the video is a liquid manure spreader with an injection toolbar. Inside the box is a sheet that describes the method of calibration. In this case, it was the oxalate method. The contents of the box include an example application record, calculation sheet, simulated empty and loaded spreaders, and simulated empty and full five-gallon buckets, as well as spread areas and a marker and a ruler. Other kits included solid spreaders or simulated solid spreaders um, and manure sheets, rain gauges and collected water, uh, flow meter gauges, and spread areas that way. The really neat thing about these kits is that they've already been utilized outside of our initial programming. Um, Mary mentioned previously about someone using some content in their classes. This is one of them that I know was utilized. I don't know if there were other things that were utilized, but I know these were. Uh, uh, <coughs> I know also Mary used them in her nutrient management day a couple of months later to help teach those techniques. And I intend to use them in my winter programming for the land application training that we host here annually in Nebraska as well. And also in Nebraska here, I know NRCS is, has indicated they plan to duplicate the activity. In fact, they, one of them actually came here and went through the kits with me, and we, we figured out what, what went where um, and so that they could create their own kits and use them for training their field office staff as well. Um, so as I said, the video, the video with narration is available on YouTube. I, um, it's not a public link, but I can certainly get that link for you, so if you need it, uh, it's just not quite, it's not a professional polished video yet, so once we get that up there, that'll be public, but for now, it's, uh, it's available if you need it from me, just, just contact me. 
Um, I mentioned before that in the South Dakota and Nebraska training, we reinforced what they learned from those cal calibration activities during the infield demonstration. In the field, we calibrated the sprinkler system for their vegetative treatment system, as well as comparing the results of two different calibration methods for the solid manure spreader. And surprisingly, which doesn't usually happen when you're trying to do this for a demonstration, they actually came out to be quite close when we weighed the spreader and looked at the rate, the area that it had spread, and when we had looked at that sheet method. Uh, so that was a pretty exciting thing to happen on our, on our demonstration. The impacts of the nutrient and manure management program were pretty impressive. This chart is just a piece of that information that we collected. Uh, Mary and I believe, and <coughs> excuse me, Melissa also showed a little bit of this. A little bit of this. Uh, this is just a piece of that that focused specifically on composting. The crosshatch bars show understanding before the program, and the solid bars show understanding following the program. While some of the participants had a moderate amount of knowledge related to composting prior to the workshop, many participants had little or no understanding of the principles and skills related to composting manure and mortality. So following the program, you can see a definite shift in the understanding to the right side of the chart, of course, indicating that there would be an increase in their understanding um, due to the programming. The, the thing that I think is pretty impressive with these results is that the follow-up survey was done only two months, not, probably not even a full two months from the time that they, uh, the, the time that they took the training. So the training was done in August, the follow-up survey was, or sorry, the training was done in June, and the survey was done in August. So there wasn't a lot of time to get those things implemented. So, I was excited to see that that increase in understanding and the actual amount of implementation that they'd actually had. So this is, sorry, my next slide here is another piece. This one was less interactive, but also quite effective. Um, you can see a definite shift to the right. This is the valuing and marketing of manure. And the thing with it is that marketing manure is a pretty difficult topic, and so um, we thought it was really impressive that things had changed this quickly uh, in that short amount of time. And I appear to be missing the notes for the rest of this, so we're going to wing it. So um, in this slide, you can see that 63% of our, of our attendees that filled out the follow-up survey had already incorporated the nutrient management skills that they had learned into their outreach and programming efforts. And um, as I mentioned, with the valuing of manure marketing, I think that comes out to be like 36% had already utilized that, which is one of those hardest topics that we covered during our, during our programming. So I think, oh, the other thing that happened in August when Mary had her nutrient management day, we did have a guest speaker during the manure section of this programming. Uh, during actually at both sessions, he was live in South Dakota and Nebraska. He's originally from Nebraska. And so he came up and talked manure value, and then he, uh, he was online for the manure value in North Dakota. And so um, she invited him back after having that good conversation, invited him back in August, and she said he was even more effective at that time. So um, that increased that collaboration, not just with extension professionals, but also with industry as well. So I think that is all I have, unless Mary wants to add a little bit more on our programming, because she was pretty heavily involved with that. Nope, I think you pretty much covered it. Great, Leslie, and uh, all of our presenters, thank you so much. Um, and now, uh, we, when we have these webinars, we uh, definitely want to leave enough time for the conversation at the end, which we, we have successfully done. So thanks to our presenters um, for great information and also this discussion time. Um, uh, questions from uh, people on the line. And, and you can either uh, submit your question in the chat box or, you know, we have, um, I think we have a small enough group here that we can, if you use your talk button, uh, which is on the closer to the upper left, uh, there's a microphone symbol there that you'll see. You could also feel free to use um, 
use the talk button to ask your question. So questions from the group. Well, there's, there's a question from Janice Kepka here in Wisconsin. Has the project reviewed new review revealed new opportunities in any of the states involved? New training needed or other research needed? So I guess that's for all of our presenters. So here in North Dakota, um, after our training, we actually had some people that weren't able to come. And so for us, it really solidified that it was necessary, both parts of it. And um, I don't know that we'll do another formal training like this necessarily in next summer, but we are going to do some informal, uh, you weren't able to come, and so let's, let's have you come, and we'll, we'll just do a quick you know, one-day run-through. And so for us, it really just solidified that it was necessary and that it is something that we can uh, focus on for a bit in our programming. OK, great. Uh, this is Rebecca. I have a question. So could you, could you say a little bit more about the people that participated in the training? Um, as, as you indicated, uh, the level of adoption or ability to use this information and programming quickly to, to me was amazing. You know, sometimes, um, you know, this type of information and particularly water uh, related information is something that some of our educators may or may not feel like they can use right away in their programming. And, and it just seemed like you had, you know, the, the information that you provided was immediately applicable to your attendees. So I'm wondering about, how, you know, how you selected the attendees or, you know, how you hit that sweet spot where this was just pretty, the, the bulk of the people attending could immediately use the information that you were providing, even though it was diverse information. So I can with the manure side of things, I don't remember on the water side who we had in attendance, and this is for the South Dakota and Nebraska training. The folks from Nebraska a lot were extension educators that work in the area anyway uh, for the manure side of things. So they, while they might have been um, knowledgeable about some things, it definitely helped them to get better at what they were already doing or maybe um, provided a, a better way of teaching what they were already teaching kind of thing. Um, but I know that there was a lot of educators, and that's who we really targeted when we were ad advertising, was to, to get the folks that are trying to teach these topics already. I can't speak for the water side, though. Um, I'll go ahead and speak for, for the water side. Um, it seemed to be maybe a little somewhat similar and somewhat different between the South Dakota and Nebraska workshop and the North Dakota workshop. Um, certainly in South Dakota, we saw some representation from some of the watershed coordinators or like friends of the big Sioux, um, folks who were outside of extension, but certainly worked in an outreach capacity, um, restoration kinds of efforts. Um, with North Dakota, um, I know we had a participant from their state agencies, Game and Fish. Um, we had uh, actually at both workshops we had uh, tribal representation. Um, from South at the South Dakota workshop, we we had even one person from Missouri come who was an extension person. So there were people who were traveling from even further than our three state region um, in order to to participate in this workshop and um, if kind of going back to maybe the original question about where we could take this into the, the future, I think people were certainly engaged really at the point where we're talking about riparian buffer design and upland management and that BMP. So what are the things that we can do on the ground um, and, and what are those cost share opportunities? So. Um, you know, Tom Franti talked a lot about, from his 
research experience and his extension outreach experience about right, really what makes a good riparian buffer area um, and then having those experts talking about those cost share opportunities. I think it, to, to take the, that portion of the presentation one step further would be where, in my own opinion, uh, we might consider moving in the future. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. And you, actually, you touched on my, my part of my next question. I, would anyone else uh, have anything to add uh, about next steps for uh, the group? It sounds like you um, all the participants had a really positive experience, and that you're you're seeing some opportunities. And people sounds like have applied for additional funding. But in terms of um, you know the the team, uh, have you talked about next steps yet? Uh, no, not as a team necessarily. We haven't talked about next steps. I know uh, for North Dakota, Miranda has uh, secured funding to continue some riparian education. Um, and I'm not exactly sure to what extent that is. But um, so I know she's going to move forward with that. I always continue to move forward with my um, mineral management um, education for all of our extension agents, 319 watershed coordinators, NRCS. Um, we do trainings for them throughout the year. And so that's how we're moving forward. But as a team, you know, we haven't really discussed it much past, um, you know, making sure that we're all available to answer questions for anybody else who wants to use our slides. And you said something about how were people able to incorporate this so quickly and right away. And I think part of that, um, First of all, the hands-on. Like we had the we had the people on the ground picking the stuff up. We had them telling us the measurements, so they really felt like they knew what they were doing. Um, but then also, in our resources, we gave them the full note section. So for all of our presentations, we wrote notes out completely, um, and I think that really helps when somebody can go back. They don't have to take notes the whole time at the the training. So they can just listen, take it in, ask questions, and then they can go back and look at the notes that are there and say, oh, yeah, I remember that. And so here's how I can incorporate it now. Um, but as far as moving forward, um, I know we have some stuff planned in North Dakota, but I'm not sure about the other two states. Thanks, Mary. And that's a great point about almost the script, I think, that you have made available for educators. So. Um, I imagine that gives folks a sense of security, you know, to be able to see, uh, not only have the materials, but see some of the language there, and then they can, um, they know who to contact if, if they have questions or need to fill in some gaps. Okay, um, do we have any other, any other questions from uh, participants? Hearing none, uh, thank you all for your participation. And uh, uh, you saw we had Mary, Melissa, and Leslie's uh, contact information on that previous slide. So hopefully you got it. Uh, there it is, um, if you didn't record it already. And then uh, so we do these current webinars on a monthly uh, basis. Uh, and we are taking a break uh, for the month of December. So happy holidays, uh, everyone. Uh, and thanks for, for a great year. And again, you will be able to access the recording of this webinar at northcentralwater.org and also on eExtension's website at learn.eextension.org. Thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of the year, everybody.